Luke chapter 11, one more time, turn to Luke chapter 11. Does that get in the way? How about I do it like that? Luke chapter 11. And we're just going to read the first three verses one more time. And it came to pass that as he, that's Jesus, was praying in a certain place when he ceased, one of his disciples said unto him, Lord, teach us to pray as John also taught his disciples. And he said unto them, When ye pray, say, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, as in heaven, so on earth. Give us day by day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone that is indebted to us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And so these words, and, and I'm, I, I'm not, we're going to just take some phrases out so we can see, put words closer together to see what Jesus was saying, because he said, when ye pray, say, thy will be done. When ye pray, say, thy will be done. This is what I want to try to talk about this morning as we consider the subject of prayer one more time. <clears throat> James 4 3 says, Ye ask and receive not because ye ask amiss. James 4 3 is a warning to us that our prayers may not be answered because we ask amiss. Now, I, I was looking at my notes this morning and I read something that I had written, and believe it or not, I disagreed with myself. <laughs> Um, because this, this is, I said something like, um, we can be guaranteed that if we are asking for anything simply for our pleasure or for our gain, we, uh, we're not going to see an answer from God. And yet, as I looked at that, I thought, um, and, and I also, in my notes, had said that, that this has to do with what Psalm 37 says, Four says, which says, delight thyself in the Lord, he will give you the desires of your heart. And, and maybe this is semantics on my own part, and yet I understand that uh, we ask for our daily bread. And I, as, I, as I thought about that, I thought, well, you know, we, we ask God to provide, and all, I think by, if I had believed what I wrote there, that every day our daily bread would be hardtack or saltine crackers, something, you know, you'll get by. And that, that's not how God blesses us. Um, he blesses us with good things and, and things that we need. And sometimes the things that he give us, gives us that are things that we need are really nice and enjoyable. And, and I'm grateful for that. And yet, on the other hand, um, and I should have turned uh, to James 4.3, <clears throat> because that made me go back and study that a little bit more. This is what it says, Ye ask and receive not, because ye ask amiss, that ye may consume it upon your lusts. Or, if you put a different word in there, that's in, and it's in the margin of the King James Version, it could say, because ye ask amiss that ye may consume it upon your pleasures. And then the next verse says, Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that friendship of the world is enmity with God. And this isn't... We, we have a tendency to... We memorize a verse and we pull it out, and we forget the context. And, and so, as I looked at this, and I looked at it, in, in the Amplified, which says you ask God for something and do not receive it because you ask with the wrong motives, out of selfishness or with an unrighteous agenda, so that when you get what you want, you may spend it on your, and this word is in there, hedonistic desires. In other words, this isn't just asking for a new car if you need one. 
Um, and, I, and that's such a, that's a lame illustration. But what I'm trying to say is, there, the, James is writing and saying, some of you are asking God from a completely selfish heart. That means your heart's not right with God. And you're asking God to give you things that you can consume it for yourself. I, I guess it would be, if, if we could put it in our, in our terms today, it would be this kind of a prayer. God, give me something so that when other people look on me, they see that I'm something. Why? Because... That's operating from selfishness. That's operating from selfish desires. I guess the contrast that I'm trying to paint, and we talked about sanctification already this morning, but the sanctified heart, as Brother Jerry was pointing out, is perfect, but, it's, but we're not perfect. But our heart has to be perfect toward God. We can't have a divided heart. And I, I know that it's unfortunate that some people preach this and people are calling themselves Christians and yet they, they hold back something. I'm not talking about, I don't know. I mean, we've had so many things preached and heard so many things preached and, and it's just stuff. I'm not talking about stuff. I'm talking about deep down in your heart. Do you know that God can place His finger on anything and you're willing to do what He says to do or to give up what He says to give up? And if you... If you there was a, a song that a Southern Gospel group sang about this very thing. And, and I believe it was called The Secret Room, and it talks about going into your heart with the Savior, and you have everything cleaned and everything is ready for Him, and He goes to the one room that has the door still locked. And He wants to go in that room. Are you going to give Him the key, or do you not? How, how precious is it to you? If you're sanctified... The key goes to him. And he'll do with it what he will. But if you don't give him the key and you're not willing to let him look into that part of your life or your heart or your secret inner life, you have a divided heart. And so whenever we read James 4.3, we're seeing people that have at best a divided heart, maybe a hypocritical heart, thinking that they can ask God for the things that will make them happy and have pleasure right now, no matter what God says. Because it doesn't matter what God says. That's the contrast I'm trying to make, is between the sanctified heart and the one who's still serving self, the selfish heart. Well, so in order for us to pray properly, I have to catch back up in my notes here. In order for us to pray properly, our desires must be aligned with God's desires, and our thoughts must be aligned with His thoughts, and our hearts must be aligned with His heart. How do we know that our, heart, our desires are aligned with His desires? Basically, then, when we're praying outside of the will of God, it's because our heart's not right with God, and He's not going to answer it. But when our hearts are right with God, and we begin to pray, our heart is to pray what Jesus taught us, Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. But how can we know what is His will? There are some very simple things that I can guarantee you is God's will. 2 Peter 3.9 
The Lord is not slack concerning his promises. Some men count slackness, but is long suffering to us, word, here we go, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So if, if you're praying, I, I remember uh, there were a couple guys that worked with us, this is long, long ago, and, and not even in this place. Um, I worked with uh, one, one guy um, was, was a church member and, and active in the church. Um, and then we had a couple guys that worked with us that, that actually came to church but weren't right with God and they knew it and we knew it and everybody knew it. And uh, he came to me one day and he said, God told me that I should just stop praying for them. Listen, I, I don't think that that probably was God talking to him. I think that was his own discouragement. And frankly, one of those guys is a pastor today. And the other one um, moved off and, and left, and ten years later he came back around and uh, professed to have been soundly converted, and I haven't talked to him in years. And, and I honestly can't tell you the direction his life has taken, but I believe that God helped him as well. This is what I'm trying to say. It's always in God's will that we pray for people who need to be saved. Always. It's not God's will that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Now we could say, well, why doesn't God make that happen if it's His will? Because His purpose goes beyond making us do something. His purpose is for us to hear His call, see His love, and choose to love Him. So have no doubt that God's great purpose is to see everyone, men and women, saved from destruction who will come to Him. It's also His desire that God's people who call themselves by His name understand what it means to be sanctified believers. 1 Thessalonians 4.3 For this is the will of God, even your sanctification. I got a text this morning. Somebody telling me about somebody else that said I'm, they, they're not even sure what they believe about this. And I said, well, Actually, that's good in the sense that they're asking questions. I'm, I'm, I'm glad that it matters to them that they know that they believe what the Bible says. But on the other hand, the Bible, I just read to you 1 Thessalonians 4.3, this is the will of God, even your sanctification. And this is the Apostle Paul writing to a church. He doesn't name names. He just says it's his will. God's will for them to be sanctified. And so you have, and, and what I was telling this person is, who, whoever it is, they need to deal with what the Bible says about being sanctified. What does God mean when he says through his apostle, my will is that you be sanctified. You, you know, the bottom line is this. I guess this is what I'm trying to say. There are some people that are very rigid in how they teach this sanctification. Um, I've read in, my, in the course of study that I took, I read um, a whole compilation of different writers and, and people over probably 150 year period so not just, not just one group, not just one church, not just one era, but across um, generations that were talking about this. And believe it or not, they didn't all even agree. <laughs> and yet they did agree on this one thing, that the Bible says sanctification is for the believers, and, and we should be seeking it. So, 
this is the will of God, even your sanctification. If you are praying to be sanctified and asking God to show you what that means, and if, or if you are praying for someone else that you see with the divided heart to be sanctified, you're praying within God's will. The, the, I read to you 1 Thessalonians 4.3. The next verse says that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. We are within God's will when we pray for sanctification and for people to be sanctified. It's Jesus' great desire. Listen, we, we went through John 14, 15, 16, and 17. And it's, it's the great theme of Jesus' dissertation and his, and his prayer that we would be one with God, us in Him, He in us. And He said, even then He prayed that we might be sanctified. He talks about the coming Comforter. It's all tied together. In John chapter 17, he's, this was the first verse, these words, I'm sorry, it's the, uh, that Jesus be glorified. Um, these words spake Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Follow, I'm sorry, Father, the hour is come and glorify thy Son, that thy Son may also glorify thee. We're praying that God be glorified in sanctification. That's really what he wants to do. He wants to shine through us. That's what Jesus was saying. Glorify thy Son. He was our example. When we pray that God be glorified, we are praying in God's will every time. But how about our thoughts? Aligning our thoughts with His thoughts. Proverbs 23, 7 says, For as He, that's me, you, thinketh in His heart, so is He. So we can say things, we can read the Bible, we can impress people with how our, obviously we're in line with what God wants. But God knows our hearts and He knows our thoughts. He, that's where He wants to deal with us. He wants to know. And he does know. Proverbs 24, 9, the thought of foolishness is sin, or the plans of the foolishness, foolish is sin. Psalm 139, 7, how precious also are thy thoughts unto me, O God. That's where the psalmist says in, in Psalm 139, 23, search me, O God. And what does he say? Know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. This, this has to do with if our thoughts are going to align with God's thoughts, we have to put aside all imagination that we can impress God. The way that we... We, we, we actually... I mean, there are people who try think they can fool God the way that they fool people. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Can you open your thought life to God? Well, you might say, I'm, I'm not sure. And the devil can use, the, use a trap right there. Because even as sanctified Christians, the devil tempts us. And he tempts us in our thoughts. And just as we reject temptation physically, we reject temptation mentally. So he can bombard us with things. And we say, no, I don't want that. And that's when we cry out to God for help. And that actually shows that you're letting God deal with your thoughts. And your thoughts can be aligned with Him. Isaiah said, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. 
For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. And there's two things that we can take away from that little passage of Scripture. Number one, while we're trying to align our thoughts with His thoughts, we understand that His are way higher than ours. There's no way that we can think all of the same thoughts that God does. But as we understand His will, and we understand how He wants us to think and live, we can align our thoughts with His by rejecting what we know is unrighteous and embracing what pleases Him. How do we do that? Well, we think on things that are higher. We turn our thoughts to think on higher thoughts, for His ways are higher than our ways, His thoughts than our thoughts. And if we turn our direction in our thinking, this isn't, by the way, um, some, some sort of psychological exercise that I'm talking about. I'm talking about pursuing things that are good and right. The Apostle Paul in Philippians chapter 4, verse 8, said, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, I, I could stop on every one of those. <laughs> if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. Aligning our thoughts with His thoughts. But what about aligning our hearts with His heart? What, what can we know about the great heart of God? If we go to the book of Matthew, for we understand that Jesus is God revealed to us in the flesh. He shows us. He tells us. He, he's... That's, why he, that's one of the reasons he came. You know, I, I've, and, and maybe you have asked the same question too, especially around Christmas, and, and you think, there, there's a song, again, what a strange way to save the world. Maybe we could have come up with a different plan, and yet God, in his perfect plan, sent His Son not just to die, but to first live to show us who God is. To live as one of us and be the perfect example. So who is God? Look at uh, verse 36 in Matthew chapter 9. It says this. If you could just take this and, and envision it. But when He saw the multitudes, He was this is Jesus. Let, let, let's try to get in the moment. Jesus preaching and teaching and dealing with people. And thousands would follow Him. And when, it's when He saw them, when He looked on the multitudes. So picture Him standing in front of the 5,000. He sees them. And it says His heart was moved with compassion. He saw them not as farmers and carpenters and whatever kind of laborers there might have been. Not as merchants and um, whatever else they might have been doing to make a living in that day. But He saw them as people who had come to Him with hearts that were hungry for something they didn't have and yet they longed for it. And his heart was moved with compassion on them. How much was his heart moved with compassion? By the way, let me, let me finish reading this little passage. He was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and they were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. And, and if you turn to the last chapter of Hebrews, it, it talks about Jesus being that great shepherd of the sheep. 
Here it says they're like sheep without a shepherd. There it says he is the great shepherd of the sheep. He saw their need and he met it. They needed a shepherd and he said, I will be the shepherd. Then saith he unto his disciples, the harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. His heart was moved with compassion because they were lost. They didn't even know sometimes, they didn't understand even what they were seeking, and yet they were seeking something. In, in Matthew chapter 14, verse 14, it says, And Jesus went forth and saw a great multitude. Once again, there he is, looking over people. And he was moved with compassion. But do you know what he did? He healed their sick. If you go to, um, let's go to Mark chapter 1. Because I want us to, to see the whole picture um, in verse 41. And Jesus, moved with compassion, put forth his hand and touched him and saith unto him, I will be thou clean. This was the leper. And, and I love how he came and he said, uh, he didn't just say God, he didn't just say Jesus Make me clean. He didn't demand anything. He said, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. And what did Jesus say? I will. We're, once again, we're talking about God's will. And when it's God's will for something to happen, He said, I will. Be thou clean. And He was clean. Listen, that was leprosy. But that's what God does for people's hearts. Why? Because He sees them with compassion. And I hope it breaks your heart whenever you look on people and you see them suffering. And you just want to say, don't you see the problem? The problem is you're embracing things that are destructive. God tells you in His Word, don't live that way. It's destructive. It hurts you. But if you... And can we talk them into it? Probably not. Can we pray for them? Absolutely. And as we pray for them, they can come to God and say, I'm, I'm dirty, I'm broken. And Jesus looks with compassion when they say, but if you will, you can make me clean. And he says, it is my will, and you are clean. Why? Because of his great compassion. And, and it's easy for us to think about it and, and see it. And I, and I have one more verse I'm going to read to you from the book of Mark in chapter 6, verse 34. And Jesus, when he came out, saw much people and was moved with compassion toward them. Here it is again. Because they were a sheep, not having a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. Here's what I want to say. Our hearts aligning with the heart of God. Jesus showed us the heart of God. Over and over, he looked on people with compassion. And he was driven by that compassion. He healed people because of his compassion. He fed people because of his compassion. He touched lepers because of his compassion. He raised the dead because of his heart. His heart hurt with people when they came to him. We know the shortest verse in the Bible says that Jesus wept. As he stood in front of the grave of Lazarus, knowing that he, he was going to raise Lazarus from the dead, he still felt the pain of death. And his compassion 
moved him to weep with the people. Why? Lazarus came out of the grave. There was great rejoicing. But as Pastor Eric pointed out last week, Lazarus isn't with us here today. And as Jesus broke the, the chains of the grave and He brought forth someone from the dead, He knew that the curse of death was still on humanity. He knew that He had to suffer it with us to truly identify with us. And He looked on with compassion. And so, and, and this is the greatest thing, I believe, is that when He saw people as, as sheep without a shepherd, He became our shepherd. What really broke His heart is that people were lost. I want to ask you this. Whenever you see people Is it easier for you to just shrug it off? Listen, I, I, I drive down Colfax every day. Between, I drive, I usually go over Kipling and down to Sheridan. I, some of the, I, I just shake my head. All of, it, it's like every disease and pain and malady known to man is on display people that don't have a home. I, I forget, in the last eight days, two or three people have been murdered in that stretch. It's everywhere. It's rampant. And it's easy to write it off. And I can't fix. I probably couldn't fix one. If I tried to take one person and say, hey, get in my truck, we're going to fix you, I couldn't do it. but they're like sheep without a shepherd. Jesus is the great shepherd of the sheep. How do you look at them? Do you see them as another tramp? Or do you see them as shepherd without a sh or sheep without a shepherd? Compassion. Our hearts can be aligned with God in his heart when we have compassion and see people the way that he sees them. Of course, he didn't just stop there. He loved us. And he gave himself for us. How does that translate for us? Really, our love translates in a couple ways. Jesus taught his disciples that their love for each other would be what the world saw. And I, I can tell you this morning that, um, that I feel like there's unity in our little group. I like that. It encourages me. Um, I hope that you always keep in mind, because you know what, we're just people. And some of us are more annoying than y'all. <laughs> and the devil likes to take our shortcomings and just blow them out of proportion so that he can destroy a community of believers. I've seen it happen time and again. We should always remember that to be living in God's will, we need to have love for one another. Now, here's the thing. It's easy for us to love people that are easy to love. But really that calling translates to the most difficult person. It's really where it comes down. Because what, how, how hard is it? How much working does God have to do in our lives for us to love somebody that dearly loves us? Not much. But what, what about somebody that's abrasive? Rubs us the wrong way. That's who we need. And it's tempting to just say, you know what, I love them, but they're going to be over there. Pretty soon they begin to feel that attitude. 
We need to love them even when they're difficult. One more thing that I'm going to mention. I've mentioned our community of believers where we need to see God's love showing between each of us. But it's also each one of us, we, we need to not just love those who are a part of our little church, but there are other people who name the name of Christ and we need to show charity towards them as well. Do we always agree with everybody that calls themselves Christians? Absolutely not. I'm just telling you the truth. That's how it is for me. I'm not going to begin to explain to you every person I know that calls himself a Christian. And, I'm, and, and whenever I feel like I'm close enough to that person and I feel like they're doing something that's sinful and destructive and I feel like I can call them out, I will. But we're not called to call everybody out. But we are called to love. Jesus also put on display the ultimate illustration of what it means to serve within the context of Christianity. You remember he got on his knees and he washed the feet of his disciples. He was showing them something that was completely counter to humanity. Not just in our society, sometimes we say that, but in theirs then as well. They were, uh, in a smaller group, they were among the Jewish people. They were Jews. Um, but on a larger scale, they were governed by the Romans. And there was no example of leadership that was serving people. Even among their own um, religious leaders, those men were serving themselves. They were using their position for their advantage. Jesus said, I'll show you what it means to be first in the kingdom. I'll get on my, feet and wa on my knees and wash your feet. Now, he was illustrating that he took the, part, the place of a servant because that was a servant's job. This is the God of the universe, the maker of humanity, getting on the floor and washing the dirty feet of sinful men. We say, wow, that's quite an example. But he went farther. For he knelt in the garden and said, Father, if it be possible, knowing what he was facing, if it be possible, let this cup Pass from me, nevertheless. Not my will, but thine be done. And he showed us as he took that attitude. In the very face of wanting to avoid what was coming. Laying down his own desires. Laying down his own the, the thing within him that humanly was saying, avoid this pain. And rather saying, I submit to the will of the Father, even unto death. And as he died, he made provision for all of us to be saved. Now that, that's, that's, putting a, that's lumping a lot into one or two words. And, and I can't preach it all to you this morning. But what I am saying is he gave up his life, not just to give up his life, not just as an example of submitting to God. But his, his death on the cross, his blood that was shed, made a way that we could, we could do what men had never really been able to do. Most men, even those who would have been considered righteousness for thousands of years, had made a blood sacrifice that was never sufficient. It had to be done over and over and over again. 
Jesus gave the blood sacrifice, and, and eventually he, he rose from the dead, we know, and he ascended up to God, and um, he's at the right hand of the Father. And this high priest isn't like a human high priest who had to give sacrifice for his own sin before he could sacrifice the, do the sacrifice for the sins of others. But he made one sacrifice that once for all paid the price. I'm, I'm, and I'm trying to, I, you know these things, but I'm trying to say to you this morning is that when our hearts are aligned with God and His heart, we're going to have His compassion his love is going to flow through us. But it's not, for, it's not just to be wasted, but it's for service. It's to serve. And when we serve in God's kingdom, we realize that to be that kind of a servant, in, or to be a leader in God's king, kingdom is to be a servant. And he calls us out and he saves us and he gives us, he gives us gifts. He gives us a calling. He gives everybody a calling. Don't, don't, don't sit here this morning and say, that, that's the preacher up there and he's fulfilling his calling and I'm going to sit here and receive. And just take in and take in and take in because I don't have a calling. Not so. The apostle, when he wrote about us being one body, was was saying to us that we all have a place. We're all called to a place within the body of Christ. And our calling, interestingly enough, usually aligns with our gifts. And so we have our calling and we have our gifts, but are we going to serve? I heard, and, and I, I don't speak Spanish, but I sat here as um, Pedro and I preached in Spanish, and I, heard, I could understand enough to know what he was saying. And he preached from the passage that we use when we take communion together, and, and it talks about Jesus taking the bread and breaking the bread and then giving the bread out. And he used that to show how God does that with us. We come to him and he takes us, but what happens next is to break us and make us what we should be. Take us from what we were. And sometimes it hurts and sometimes it's hard. But then He has us ready to be able to be in service to Him. And, and honestly, I'm up here without a clock but I think that means I should be done. <laughs> Let me try to wrap this up. Praying in God's will is what we're talking about. And Scripture tells us that there are some things that we can know are God's will, and it's, we can pray that way every time, and we're always praying in God's will. And among those things that we can expect is for God to lead us and guide us and provide for us. He said that. Give us this day our daily bread can, can mean food, yes, but it can also be everything that we need, which includes His guidance and His Spirit. But ultimately, we have to be ready to pray as Jesus prayed, not my will, but thine be done. And as we read in Luke 11 too, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. How's God's will done in heaven? It's done absolutely without fail. And that's what we long for on earth as Christians. Well, we started out with the words, Lord, teach us to pray. And I talked about how we have to have a heart that's right with God. It, otherwise, we'll ask amiss. And 
God won't hear us. But as our hearts are aligned with God, as we're, as we're made right with Him, we'll have His compassion, His love, His service. All of those things are going to be in line with Him. We don't have to worry about praying outside of God's will. For our prayer is, as Jesus taught us, not my will, but thine be done. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Let's stand together, if you will. Let's bow our heads together. Real quickly, I would just say that if God has spoken to you and you realize that maybe there's something within your heart and you have a divided heart, that God is ready to meet you here this morning if you want to pray. And we're ready to help you pray. Or maybe you just came in this morning and you were just discouraged and down. And you realize that God is, is on your side and you want to just talk to Him about it. You can come and pray as well. But if God's talking to you and you don't come this morning, don't turn Him aside. Find a place to pray and draw close to Him. Our Father, we come to you this morning. We thank you for your word. We thank you that we have your example and that you taught us about praying and how to do it and what it means and all of those things. Lord, we pray that all of us who are here this morning and even those who may be listening would have hearts that are not divided, but that will have hearts that are perfect before you completely submitted to your will, no holding back. Lord, we pray that you'll help us to see people with the kind of compassion that you do and love them and each other and other folks in different denominations. Help us, Lord, to be kind to them and love them. And we pray that you'll help us to serve in the place that you've given us to serve. We pray that you'll go with us, keep us safe, Bring us back together again according to your will. In your name we pray it. Amen. And you are dismissed.